I saw some people up dancing. Some of y'all just need to get up and shake your groove thing. Well, my name's Jimmy Bratcher. I'm from Kansas City, Missouri. My wife, Sherry, is here with me. Sherry, would you stand up and wave at everybody so they'll know who you are? And we have been friends with Tom and Kim longer than we both like to admit. And uh, we served together at the same church on the same pastoral team together. And uh, that was many years ago. Tom, actually, I was his boss. So if Tom Dillingham can have a boss. But anyway, so we're just thrilled to be here. Sherry and I, we have the opportunity to be in churches pretty much every Sunday somewhere in America. Uh, you know, this weekend we're here with you all. Next weekend we'll be in Indianapolis. Weekend after that we'll be in Alabama. And, uh, and so we're always in church on Sunday morning. But because of my music, my band and I, we've been able to have all kinds of other opportunities open up for us. Because I believe Jesus is our model for how we should do ministry. And the one thing that Jesus did was he did ministry everywhere. And so we have just a little 60-second video to show you some of the places where we are invited to go. have it some of the places that were there in that video we just finished a week-long tour of prisons in Kansas uh, called the transformation tour so we spent a week did six prisons in five days full team full band did yard events we stood in front of thousands of convicted felons and we were able to talk to them about transformation we were able to be there to demonstrate for them what Christians should look like and what Jesus looks like. The most important thing was we were able to pray with thousands of them. Another clip in the video was of um, a thing back last fall in uh, Toronto called the Invictus Games, which is an international wounded warrior competition that Prince Harry started. Yeah, the one that just got married, Prince Harry. And uh, so we were invited, I was invited to go to perform at that, and Sherry and I last year in 2017 were invited twice to go visit our wounded warriors at Walter Reed Hospital in uh, Washington, D.C. And then, of course, Sturgis. We go to Sturgis every year. We'll be there again August 4th through the 8th. Last year, we were invited by the legendary Buffalo Chip, which is the largest music venue there, uh, to perform, and we got to open for the Doobie Brothers. And so in the year before that, we got to open for Willie Nelson. So Willie, Doobies, I don't know, something's going on there, some kind of, kind of deal. But, uh, but so that just gives you a little glimpse of that we're just out doing what we need to do. We call it the ministry is showing up because the equation is Christ's in us, where we go, he goes, and where he goes, stuff happens. And you all have that same ministry. I have, we have brought some things, some resources with us that are out on the table. And these, if you buy them, they help us to be able to go to some of these places that do not compensate for compensate us. So, you know, like you can't go to prison and sell CDs, you know what I'm saying? So anyway, but I'd like to give away some of these. This is my book uh, that I wrote a few years ago called Don't Take Your Dreams to the Grave. And it's a book of encouragement to get you be busy being you. And I would like to specifically give this to a single mom. We have a single mom right here in the second row. And uh, would you give this here? She's going to come. Here you go. Let's give her a hand. Here you go, sweetheart. If you come to the table, I'll sign that for Sherry and I will both sign it. We, uh, single parents are our heroes. And if you're a single parent, I want you to know that you are not insufficient. You, God will give you everything that you need to be able to do the job that you need to do. And you and Jesus are enough. Is that right? 
We have some teaching series, and I forgot to bring any of these, but one of them is called The Marriage of Your Dreams, and if you'd like to have some of that stuff from our teaching stuff, you can go online. You can stop by the table and just pick up a card and go online, and you can order those things. Sherry and I, we just got finished writing a book about our story, and it's a hardback book. I love this. It's full color. It's got pictures and everything, and uh, the book, the title of the book is Granny paid for our divorce. And so if you want to, if you're like sitting there going, what? Granny paid for our divorce. So I would specifically like to give this to someone who has faith for their marriage. Is there someone here that has faith for their marriage? I see you back there. Here you go, sir. Come down here and grab this, or you can take it back to him if you would. And come by the table and we'll sign it for us. We just got that finished and got it back just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, so we'd like for that. How, I have one more thing I'm going to give away, and I don't have a slide for this, but uh, this is a, a DVD called The Little Girl Wins. And the little, the little Girl Wins. I can hear Sherry saying, now slow down. The Little Girl Wins. And it's a story about our family and something just really just, just unbelievable happened to our family in 2011. My daughter Jessica, who I'd never met, when she was 38 years old, came into our family. And uh, I received an email on February 13, 2011 from a girl that I dated back a long, long time ago and uh, when I was just a teenager. And the email said, it's overdue that you should meet your daughter and your grandsons. And so it started a journey of us coming together. And this DVD is uh, is Jessica and I telling our story. So I'd like to know if there's someone here that you have a parent that you have never met, someone that you've, that's alienated from you. <coughs> Is there anyone? Would somebody like to have this DVD? There you go, hon. <coughs> so when you watch it, you have to have a hanky. So anyway, so now that we're all done with business and I'm choking up, I can't believe that video that Tom did. That was unbelievable that he got through that without insulting me. I just, I was waiting. I was, I was, I was all prepared. I'm disappointed for him to like say something like, you know, we have Jimmy Bratcher here with us this morning. Y'all forgive him because he's old, you know, something along those lines. But anyway. So let's pray and we'll get, we'll get into the Bible and just look at some stuff. Father, thank you so much that you called us out of darkness into your marvelous light, that you came for us, that you chased us, that you found us, that you redeemed us. And Lord, we just thank you for that. Thank you that we can come together and, and Lord, we can just serve you and we can follow you, but we can come to church, Lord, and, and we can meet with you we can our hearts can be changed and we can be transformed. Lord, thank you. Lord, that this word today, Lord, that we might not just hear it, but we might do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I'm a Jesus freak. I mean, I'm a Jesus freak. I met Jesus and everything changed. And when I read the Bible, I read about Jesus. Jesus, he was a wild man. I mean, he was wild. He was all the time freaking everybody out. Sorry, that's an old hippie term. My my inner hippie is coming out, as you can tell. But he was a wild man, and they said in the Bible when Jesus was on the scene, they said, we've never seen anything like this before. They'd never seen a, a, a teacher, a religious leader that was anything at all like Jesus because of how he treated people. Jesus treated people different than any other religious teacher or leader of that day because he showed respect for people and concern and care and he treated them with honor and with dignity and and it was just wild. Jesus, they said it was a wild man because they'd never heard anything like him before. And when he talked, it was just, there was something about what he said that when he spoke, it spoke right to the heart of everyone that heard him. And I don't know about you, but I want to be wild like Jesus is wild. 
My, my text today will be found in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Proverbs 4, 23. And this really isn't a sermon. This is like my life. This is part of my life that I'm sharing with you today. Proverbs 4, 23 in the New King James says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Proverbs in, in the New Living Translation, in Proverbs 4.23, it says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. The Bible here directs us to our hearts, because God is... I'm going to start yodeling here in a minute. Can you tell? <clears throat> God is a heart God. He's a heart God. And your heart is the observation point of God. When God looks at you, He doesn't look at your successes. He doesn't look at how well behaved you are. He doesn't look at your failures. He looks at your heart. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says that God does not look as a man looks, for man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. The heart is the observation point of God. Now in Proverbs 4.23, it tells us that we are to keep our heart with all diligence. That word diligence means the guard at the gate of the prison. Now Sherry and I go in prisons all over America, and everyone we go into, there's a guard at the gate. And he has a twofold job. He's to keep in what's supposed to be kept in, and to keep out what's not supposed to come in. And the Bible tells us that we need to keep or guard our heart in that way. And it goes on to say, for out of it, out of our heart, springs the issues of life. That word issues is simply defined as the geographical boundaries, the limitations. You see, the things that you and I face in our life that we think are outwardly imposed limitations are not. Because the Bible tells us that our limits, the limits on our life, are all coming forth from out of our heart, from what we really believe. Because after all, Jesus said it like this. He said, all things are possible to him who believes. And that has to be the truth. So if I'm seeing a limitation in my life, it's because of something that I believe. Now, I've titled this message today, I stole it from the band The Eagles, for all you old-timers, for all you old Eagle fans, for those of you that's like, who? It's like, go look them up on YouTube. They're kind of a big deal at one time. And, uh, and they had a song, and I stole the title of this song for my message, and it's titled, Take It to the Limit. There you go. Thank you for that help. I appreciate that. So today I want to encourage you to take two things to the limit. Are you ready? Number one, we need to take our faith to the limit. Why? Because faith is the big deal with God. It is the issue. God is only ever going to ask you for one thing, and that's faith. That faith, we can, we, I like to relate to it as trust. God is asking you and I to trust Him. Faith is the big deal. That's what God is after. And faith pleases God. Hebrews 11.6 tells us that without faith, it's impossible to please God. So I don't know about you, but I want to be in the business of pleasing God. Faith is the commodity of exchange with heaven. So if you're going to do business with God, if you're going to do business with heaven, if you're going to see the promises of God come to pass in your life, it's because you do business with God on the basis of faith. We live in a very needy planet. We have great needs in our world that need to be addressed. And yet it seems that nothing happens. I just did an event with uh, last week with Sam Childers, the machine gun preacher. Have you seen that movie? Gerard Butler played in it. It's about a guy that, that just like went to the worst part of the worst part of Africa and just said, I'm going to reach these people and I'm going to care for these children. It's like there's all this need there in Sudan, but there were other ministries working there. But for Sam, he showed up and had to defend his ministry with a machine gun. 
And God created that opportunity, not because there was a need there, but because there was faith there. And he was given, like a couple of years ago, the Mother Teresa Award for Social Justice. So this isn't some like fly-by-night guy. This guy's legit. And you and I are the same way. When we have a need in our life, we can have it and nothing seems to happen. But the moment that we place our faith, we find a promise in the word of God that speaks to that need. We begin to ponder it. We begin to dream about it. We begin to see and visualize ourselves what we would look like when that promise comes to pass in our life. And the next thing you know, it's real in our heart. It's part of who we are. It's not an opinion that we hold. It's part of the very fiber and nature of who we are. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, that promise comes to pass in our life. We need to be those people that are identifying the limitations in our life and attacking them with faith in the word of God to see those boundaries removed. There are some things in your life right now that just need you to believe that they're possible. I mean, there's, there are things, and Sherry and I can testify this. If you get the, you know, granny paid for our divorce, you'll see our story that we had to overcome tremendous obstacles in our life. You know, like divorce is kind of a big deal, you know, when you're divorced. And, and we did that not because we had the education, not because we had the abilities, but because we had a simple trust that it was possible for us to overcome the situation that we created in our life and see God move in our family. And there are some of you here today that things would be radically transformed in your world if you would just simply take your faith to the limit. We need to take our faith to the limit because it has some work to do. Everybody say work. work. It's a four-letter word. You know, I know that, but everybody say work one more time. Work. Number two, I have a two-point sermon on point number two, the boy is flying. Number two, we need to take our love to the limit. Everybody say love. Love, love is the only expression of, gen of genuine faith. I'll say it again. Love is the only expression of genuine faith. Galatians 5, 6 tells us, For if we are in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith, activated and energized and expressed and working through love. Love is the indefensible strategy of heaven. When God needed a plan for planet earth, for fallen man, his strategy was, God so loved the world. Love is the indefensible strategy of heaven. And we need to, you know, I'm in churches pretty much every week and been a Christian for 40 years. And one of the things I think that we need to do most is we need to take our love to the limit with each other. Because I'm in too many churches that are tore up by somebody, they tore up, they tore up by somebody that hasn't taken their faith to the limit and their love to the limit. And it's just sickening to watch. I'm told you I'm going to go to Yodeling here in a minute. It's just sickening to watch. It is. And being in church for that long, you know, I've been around Christians, man, they get on my last nerve. Come on now, I mean it. It's like, you know, talk to the hand. You know, I don't, I don't even want to hear about it. You know, just leave me alone. And we had, we had this guy in our church one time, and he was that way, man. Anytime he'd start talking, it's like, I kill you. <laughs> it's like he's just dragging his fingers down a blackboard, you know. It's like, oh, man. I was praying for him one day. Lord, take him out. Take him out. He needs to go to heaven right now. And the Lord said, yeah, I'm going to take you out if you don't change your attitude. And I said, okay, God. I don't have the capacity in my heart to love this man. I was honest. I mean, this dude got on my nerves, right? You're going to have to enlarge my heart so that I can have the capacity to do what you've commanded me to do. And you know what happened? I believed that. 
And you know what happened between me and that man? He became one of my very best friends. But it was only because I said, I'm going to believe that it's possible, and I'm going to ask God to expand and to give me the love that I need for him. And we need some believers that are standing up and demonstrating the reality of Jesus in the church. Where when we have problems, we're demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit rather than the works of the flesh. That we're able to to see past the problems and the mistakes of each other and those things that annoy us and really demonstrate to the world who Jesus is. Because Jesus said it like this, they will know that you're my disciples by your love one toward another. So that's what the outside world is waiting for. They're waiting to see how we treat each other. And when we treat each other, something happens where it opens up an opportunity for us to take our faith and our love to the limit with those outside of the church that don't believe like us. And let me tell you, as a believer, that's when life gets fun. When you get beyond just, you know, having friends that are all like you and Christians like you and they believe like you and you get out amongst some people that don't smell like you and don't talk like you and don't act like you and offend you. Because that's what Jesus did. Come on now, somebody tell me I'm, I'm preaching all right. So I'm done preaching. I'm just going to tell some stories now. I got two stories to tell. And these stories all have something in common. Are you ready? I'll just tell you up front so you don't even have to figure it out. Here it goes. Somebody invites somebody to come to church. Say it with me. Somebody invites somebody to come to church. Look, it's raining in here. Did you all see that? There it is. Rain from heaven. How about that? Here it is. One more time like you mean it. Even from the cheap seats back there where you're hiding. Somebody Invite somebody to come to church. Did you know that that's how more people come to Jesus than any other way? In America, more people come to Jesus because somebody invites somebody to come to church. Research says that 67% of Americans say a personal invitation from a friend would be very or somewhat effective in getting them to attend church. 67%. Now, when Tom and I were, and Kim and Sherry were serving together back in the 90s, that was 96%. It also says that 63% of Americans said a personal invitation from a friend or a neighbor would be very or somewhat effective in getting them to visit a church. The same research went out and asked people that go to church, how many of you would invite somebody to come to church with you. 2%. So we have a culture that says, I would really like to see what you have going on. Would you invite me? And we're saying, you know, I don't have faith for that, and I really don't have love for tolerating you. And that's, that's the way it works. So I have two stories. Number one's about a guy named Richard, and we were doing a service And we were doing a service with our Harleys because we figured out those motorcycles will preach the gospel. And so we did this big event at an amphitheater in our city. And, and, you know, we had our Harleys out there. And and there was a guy running around town. And somebody saw him and thought, this guy needs to come to that service. So guess what? Somebody invites somebody to come to church. Say it with me. Somebody invites somebody to come to church. And so he comes, and this dude's like the epitome of a motorcycle dude. Long hair, you know, full beard, ponytail, tattoos everywhere, you know, black Harley shirt, black jeans, black boots, and a black chain drive wallet. He had everything going on for him, motorcycle, except one thing. He didn't have a motorcycle. But he came to that event, and for the next church service we had, he came. And at the end of the service, like there will be here today, there was an opportunity for people to believe on Jesus. And he said, I want to believe. And when I saw him do that, I thought, you know what? There's a brother that's going to take some people's love to the limit right there. 
And we had church on Friday night was our midweek service. And so Richard, man, he worked all week. He got paid on Friday night, so he went to the, to the store and cashed his check, went to the bar and drank as much as he could, as fast as he could, because he didn't want to be late for church. So he came walking in the door, and I could smell him coming. I mean, he was wasted. And he went over and sat down in a section, and wasn't a few minutes, a whole herd of ushers come up to me going, Pastor Jimmy, there's a drunk guy over there. You think we ought to throw him out? And I'm thinking, well, if we do, you know, he's going to go back to the bar, and they're going to let him in there, you know. So I said, well, is he bothering anybody? He said, nah, he's real happy. It's like, well, good. Maybe he can share that happiness around here with some of these unhappy Christians. On Sunday morning, I was out in the lobby, and he came walking in, you know, all of his Harley regalia on, and a black Bible, a King James Bible. And I put my arm around him, and I said, Richard, man, you was drunk Friday night. What's up with that? And he hung his head and said, I'm sorry, Pastor Jimmy. I said, look up here. I said, you see that seat right there? That seat's got your name on it. And I want you to be sitting in that seat every time we're having church. And I don't care whether you're drunk or sober or straight or stoned. I want you to be sitting there. Because I know if you sit there and you listen to this word that's being preached and you let these people around here love you, it's not going to be very long before you're not going to feel the need to go to the bar before you come to church. And one Sunday morning he came to church and he decided he was going to get all of God that he could get out of that service. And this is no offense to you all back there in the cheap seats, but it ain't the same back there as it is down here in the front. And so he came down, he found a seat on a second row, and he sat down right next to Miss Prim and Proper. She was dressed to the nines and just left her estate. And I walked by and saw that, and I said, "Mm mm-hmm. Somebody's love's going to the limit this morning. She's a great Christian lady, and she started talking to him, businesswoman, and she said, well, what kind of work do you do, Richard? And he said, well, ma'am, I'm a, I'm a tattoo artist, and I do exotic body piercing. And she lived a sheltered life, and she said, you know, I don't think I've ever seen anything pierced on anybody other than their ears. Well, Richard, being polite, he just slightly raised up his shirt to reveal his work right there on the second row of church. She came screaming out of her seat and found me, and I'm like, you all, I enjoyed it thoroughly. Because that's the way it ought to be. We ought to have the down and outers and the up and outers sitting right next to each other in church. Because although we reach out to the down and outers and we do a pretty good job at that, We need some people that are going to raise up and say, I'm going to reach out to the up and outers because the up and outers are just like the down and outers, except they got some stuff. They're just as miserable, just as lost, need answers for the situations in their lives. And they're looking for somebody to step up and say, let me show you what Jesus is like. One more story and then I'll quit. There was a single mom And she was in the grocery store shopping. And there was a lady there from church. And guess what happened? Somebody invites somebody to come to church. Say it with me. Somebody invites somebody to come to church. And this lady from church walked up and said, you know, I've been thinking about you, and I'd like to invite you to come to church. The single mom, she'd had a tough life. She'd been abused and abandoned and left to raise a little boy all by herself. She accepted the invitation, and as soon as she walked in that church, she felt something. She felt respected. She felt welcomed. She felt honored, and she felt loved. And it was magnetic. And it just drew her, even before she even got into the church, before the songs were sang, before the preaching happened, something happened in her heart by just the attitude of the people that met her when she walked in the door. Not talking about greeters and ushers. Those are all great. I'm talking about just folks 
And it was magnetic, and so it attracted her, and so she started coming back with her little boy. And one Sunday night, the pastor closed the service and said, we're just going to have a time of prayer. If you're here and you need somebody to pray with you, you have a need in your life, we want to pray with you and believe that God is going to answer your prayers. And she had all kinds of needs, but she had all kinds of shame. And she was paralyzed there in her seat, and the prayer service started when all of a sudden she feels a hand tugging on her pant leg. And it was her little boy. And she bent down to see what he wanted. And she said, "Hun, what is it? What do you want? And he said, Mom, we need prayer. She said, I know we do, hun. It's going to be okay. Jesus is going to take care of us. And it appeased him for a few minutes. The prayer service went on. She feels his hand on her pant leg again, and this time he's more determined. She says, what is it, baby? What do you want? And she said, he says, Mom, Mom, we need prayer. And she says, I know we do, baby. Give me your hand. We'll pray right here. He says, no, Mom. I want to go up there. And reluctantly, she left her seat and came down front. Told the pastor it was the little boy that wanted prayer pastor got down on one knee and looked him straight in the eyes and said, son, what do you want Jesus to do for you? And the little boy told the pastor, he said, I want Jesus to bring my daddy home. So they prayed. Their life continued to get harder and harder. And one Sunday night, the single mom came to church with her little boy and her ex-husband. And there was an opportunity for people to believe on Jesus, just like there will be here in a few moments. And everyone except maybe the little boy was shocked when the ex-husband said, I want to believe. Jesus visited those two. Their marriage was reconciled. More children added to the family. And today, I had the opportunity of coming to church with that former single mom. Because you see, she's sitting right here and she's my wife, Sherry. Somebody invited somebody to come to church and Jesus invaded our lives reconciled our marriage ten months later our daughter Amanda was born our son Jason he texted me a while ago he's 44 and he lives in Dallas The reality is, is that my life was saved because somebody invited somebody to come to church. And I know if we went around the room today, many of you have that same story. But yet I wanted to share this message with you today because I wanted to commission you to invite people to come to church. Yeah, they might not accept it. They might not come. They might come, might not like it. But they might accept your invitation. They might come to church. They might hear the word. And their lives be completely transformed. Because that's what, that's what we believe. We believe that Jesus came to save sinners. And he came to give us the power to overcome. He came to save us from ourselves. And I don't know about you, but I didn't have any power to overcome myself. I couldn't stop destroying my life. I couldn't stop the, the things that were wrong with me. I didn't have the power. But Jesus had the power. 
And he shared that with me and helped Sherry and I to walk from the mess that we had made into a life where we were able to do what we needed to do, to be the father and mother, to be the husband and wife, the grandfather, the grandmother, and we're believing for the great grandkids right now. I have a secret prayer for that. I can tell you later. But it all started one night when we were born again, and Jesus talked about that. In John chapter 3, verse 3, he said, you must be born again. And the guy that he was talking to starts freaking out, and he goes, well, how's that possible? I can't enter back into my mother's womb and be born again. And Jesus said, no, you misunderstand. This isn't something that's natural. This is something that's spiritual, that it's possible for us to have a new beginning. It's possible for us to be able to start over. It's possible for us to be completely different people than we have been before. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away and all things become new. When you look at that phrase, new creature, it means a, a species that didn't previously exist. You see, Jesus didn't come to make you better. He came to make you over. He didn't come to clean you up. He came to make you over. He came to radically transform who you are. The Bible tells us that when we're born again, that there's some radical things that take place. I'm just going to talk about two of them today. Number one is that somehow God reaches into us and grabs a hold of our heart. And the Bible says that the heart that he grabs a hold of is cold, it's stony, it's indifferent, it's unteachable. And he rips it out of us. And he gives us a new heart without ever missing a heartbeat. And this heart is completely different from our old heart. This heart is pliable and teachable. And the Bible says it has his law written on it. An incredible thing that he can do without us ever missing a heartbeat. The Bible tells us that when we're born again, that we receive a new nature. That we receive a new DNA, a new genetic, that our, our genetic is no longer attached and bound to our earthly parents, but we receive a new DNA that comes from our Heavenly Father, that His characteristics, His nature, His habits, His attitudes automatically start to come out of us. It's the most incredible experience that a human being can ever have. We receive all of this by believing the truth in our heart. And the Bible says that God gives to every one of us all that we need. The measure of faith is the term that it uses. That we need to be able to believe the truth about the gospel. That Jesus came and did all that he did, lived a sinless life, was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, demonstrated to us what the Father looks like. He went to the cross and took on himself the punishment for all of our sins. He, the wrath of God for all of sinful mankind was laid on Jesus and there he was punished. He descended into hell and there defeated the devil, stripped the devil and led away those people that were bound there. And then he rose again. He was resurrected, demonstrated in front of hundreds of men and women. And now he is seated at the right hand of God. And he did all that so that he could clear everything out of the way, so that you and I could have a relationship with God, our Father. Now, if I were to ask the question today, are you born again? How would you answer? If I ask the question today, are you sure that you've been born again? How would you answer? For some of you, for most of us here, if I said, have you been born again? The answer would be yes. And you could probably say, and this is the day. This was the time. This is where I was at. And you would tell a story about that. But if you're here today and, and I say, are you born again? And you say, no. In just a moment, we're going to pray. 
And it's going to be the beginning of the most incredible experience that you've ever had. Because you're connecting to Jesus. You're connecting to God. If you're here today and you say, Jimmy, you know what? I just don't know. You know, I was sprinkled as a child or baptized as an infant or I was confirmed or went through catechism, but I don't know that I've had this experience that you're talking about. Then I want to ask that you raise your hand also. So can we do this out of reverence for God and respect for one another? Can we just bow our heads and close our eyes and let me ask those two questions again. If you're here today and you say, Jimmy, I'm not born again, then in just a moment I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and we're going to pray together. If you're here today and you say, Jimmy, I don't know, I'm not sure, then I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and we're going to pray together. Again, let me tell you, it is the most incredible experience you will ever have as a human. You see, God's not interested in how you failed or what you've done wrong. Jesus took care of all of that. But this is based on love, so it requires a response from you saying that you want to accept the love of God into your life. So if you're here today and I just ask you those two questions again, are you born again? Or are you sure that you're born again? And if that's you, then right now I'm going to ask you to lift your hand and we're going to pray together right there where you're at. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Is there anyone else? All right, here's how we're going to do this. Those of you that lifted your hands, and the whole church, all of us, we're going to pray together out loud right now. And let's pray like this. Let's pray, Jesus, say it, say it strong. Say, Jesus, I come to you just as I am, a sinner. And I want to be born again. I want a new heart. I want a new nature. I want to be forgiven. I want to know my Father. And I come to you. I confess with my mouth, I believe in my heart that you are Lord, that you rose from the dead, and I give myself to you. I will follow you all the days of my life. Now let me pray for these that lifted their hands. Father, I pray right now that this moment would be so real, so alive in their senses, in their body, that they would know this day, July 8th, 2018, I was born again. And Lord, that from this day forward, they'd have a hunger for the things of God, for the house of God, for the word of God, for the people of God. And Lord, that their lives would be transformed radically because you loved them and Jesus did what he did. Bless them now. Lord, thank you for this great church. Thank you for Tom and Kim and all the work and all the team that's here, Lord. Bless them, honor them, multiply them, and cause this place to exceed their wildest expectations. Lord, may this be a kingdom stronghold in Tulsa. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, what are you going to do when you leave here? There you go. You got it. God bless you all.